this. Um, when I first um, broached, uh, broached the topic with them, I was just kind of hoping, hey, maybe there's a class you've got somewhere I could just kind of sneak in, hand out a flyer or something like that. But they were like, no, you know, let's, let's make do this web presentation and get the word out to everybody. And um, I'm very appreciative that they're giving me this opportunity today. <clears throat> so, I mean, when I was presenting on correctional librarianship, I'm trying to think back when I first um, considered it as a career. And um, the only thing that I could really uh, think of uh, when I was looking at what correctional librarianship with was, um, has anybody seen the Shawshank Redemption? I mean, you could say it in the chat box, I'm probably not going to see it. But, um, you know, it's like you got some rickety cart, you know, wheeling it from cell to cell, um, you know, yelling, you know, going book, book, book. I was either thinking it was that or, you know, I was watching Lockup on MSNBC and going, okay, so I'm going to be trying to work with guys between like, you know, six sheets of like bulletproof glass. And it's, it's so far from that, that, um, you know, it's kind of an in-between uh, to that. Um, a lot of what we do has a lot of overlap with what you would do in the public. It's just, we serve a uh, very unique and special um, community. So with that, let me go ahead and uh, move forward. So an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I know uh, Kim already kind of gave a background of me, but I'll kind of go through that again. Um, I'll give you a little uh, taste of um, how correctional librarianship has kind of evolved um, throughout, you know, throughout time and kind of a general sense. I just did a little bit of cursory research and uh, wanted to share, um, you know, where we were and where we are now. And I think where we are now is evolving in a very interesting and, and uh, dynamic way. I'm going to give an overview of the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, um, what, our, what the mission is. And um, under the California Department of Corrections or the CDCR, we have the Office of Correctional Education, which is responsible for providing um, most of the rehabilitative programming um, for um, inmates that are incarcerated in the CDCR. And libraries happen to um, fall under that umbrella to talk about what they're doing now, too. Um, I'll give you an, uh, an idea of what it's, what it's like in a typical day with me as a correctional librarian uh, working at Salinas Valley State Prison. Um, and then I'm also going to share how to go about uh, pursuing uh, CDCR librarianship opportunities through the, you know, basically what you're going to have uh, available to you if you take a position and go through the application process. And, uh, you know, just kind of make that as easy as I can. So going through my personal history, some of it's going to be redundant because you already heard it, but I graduated um, from San Jose State in um, San Jose State University in 2006. Um, when I graduated, I'm like, man, I have a master's now. You know, it's going to be really easy to find a job out there. Um, and I found that it was it was pretty challenging getting out or when I got out there and I was looking for a position because I didn't have, um, unlike a lot of my peers um, that I, in my cohort that I went with who had been working in libraries and, um, and had decided to pursue their degree and continue, continue their career within their, their current organization, I didn't have any library experience. Um, my previous experience was um, I did substitute teaching. Um, I did a few other kind of odd temp jobs here and there, but I didn't have any direct library experience. Um, and I'm going to spoil something later on. When you work for um, CDCR as a librarian, you don't require any experience. Well, we're very happy to train you. I'm just putting that out now, but I'll, I'm going to try and uh, drum that in everybody's head as we keep going. But what I was really looking for when I was trying to find a job um, in a library was I wanted a full-time job uh, with benefits. I really didn't want to try and work something part-time, hoping it would evolve into something that was full-time. I wanted something that paid a living wage. I was um, I was tired of living at home and my parents were tired of me living at home. So um, I had to, I had to make that change happen and I wanted opportunities for growth. Um, I'm the way I'm put together. I'm always looking to learn things like my, one of my goals when I'm at work is to try and learn one new thing a day. Um, I feel like I've, I can accomplish something if I've done that. So I'm, I'm just constantly trying to grow. So that was very important to me. And it was, it was crazy that I didn't initially think about correctional librarianship, even though both of my parents um, were correctional educators. Um, my dad was a teacher. He worked, for the, um, he worked for the women's facility in Chowchilla. And my mother worked for, um, uh, uh, she worked for, uh, in Corcoran. I'm, I'm spacing on the name right now. But California State Prison at Corcoran. There we go. And they were the ones saying like, yeah, you should really put in this 
put in an application to go to the prison. And of course I was like, nah, I don't want to work in prison. I want to work here. I want to do this. I want to do that. You know, and it took a while before I finally said, yeah, let me, let me go ahead and put in an application. And one thing I really want to try and leave everybody with when I think about everybody, all of my colleagues that I work with, um, my dad used to say working for CDCR is the best kept secret in the state of California. And what I mean by that is people don't seem to consider corrections as a career or as a job option until they, until somebody comes up to them and says, hey, have you thought about working at the prison? And I want to say like probably 90% of the people that I talk to, that's what it took for somebody to say, yeah, maybe this would be something, an interesting place for me to work. Or yeah, I, I think that would be a good job for me. So a big reason that I'm here today is for those of you that are listening now and, and maybe hopefully listening to like recording later, these jobs are there and I'm, I'm encouraging you to consider working for the California Department of Corrections, whether as it's a librarian or something else, because I think it can be a great career. I think it can be something that um, you can really go, go home and feel very proud of at the end of the day. It's a challenging career, but I really think it's worthwhile, and I really want to you know, put that out there now. So my experience, I've, I just got to my 10 years working in corrections. Uh, when I started my career, I started at the Correctional Training Facility in Soledad, California, um, where I spent three years. Um, those, were a, uh, those were a great three years. I learned so much, um, uh, not just about librarianship, but about how to work with people, um, how to work. Um, it was just, it was such a, um, it was such a great experience that I was, I was constantly challenged every day because there was always something going on. There was something new to learn. There was some new resource that I was becoming, I was discovering. So that was a great, great time in my um, career. The only hard part was it was also during a time when um, the state was also going through that horrible budget crisis. So in order to make things kind of work and, and, and also for a professional growth opportunity, um, I, um, I left librarianship for a couple of years and uh, uh, went to the academy and, and was a correctional officer. So I got to experience not just the rehabilitative side of corrections, but I also got to work on the safety side. And it's, it, was, it was a very, they're, they're, they partner, but it was a very different way of looking at, um, what, looking at uh, corrections. Because when, when you're working on the rehabilitative side, it's a lot of it's about um, helping and encouraging and trying to, to um, you know, motivate people to do better. On the security side, it's like, okay, we need to make sure you follow the rules and we need to make sure you're not getting out of here. But it was a, it was a great experience and I learned a lot doing that. Um, I ended up leaving two years later for kind of the same reason. There were, um, there were a couple, uh, they were kind of letting, not letting people go, but there were some cutbacks and positions. And, but thankfully a, a senior librarian position was available at Salinas Valley State Prison, prison which was the state, you know, kind of the step up from the librarian position I was, I was in previously. And um, from there, I've been running a, a library program there for about five years. Um, I just got news not too recently that um, I will be taking um, the position as a senior librarian at the Correctional Training Facility again. Um, it was under not the best of circumstances. The senior librarian passed away over there, um, but um, they kind of needed somebody to step in and help um, kind of get the program going. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna take on that challenge starting on the 29th. So, um, you know, just kind of moving around, getting to experience a lot of different things. I'm also currently serving on the Institutional Library Advisory Committee. Um, what the ILAC does, uh, we provide, one of the main components that we do is provide training to all of the uh, library, uh, librarians, uh, librarians uh, senior librarians, and library technical assistants throughout the state of California. Um, we're currently in developing our training uh, for, um, where well, we're going to be doing a training in April of this year and we get everybody together it's a great experience we learn so much um, we're able to share our expertise um, share out the programming that we're doing share out um, different resources that we've developed or um, you know different programs that um, you know we kind of uh, piloted and we could see um, being implemented um, kind of statewide or in, in certain prisons so it's it's just it's so much fun to do um, we talk monthly and uh, we have uh, different, basically different areas of librarianship that we're trying to focus in on and, and makes CDCR uh, librarianship uh, 
you know, really shine in a lot of ways. Uh, my committee that I'm, or my subcommittee that I head is on literacy and digital literacy because I think that's so important, especially for the, um, the population that, that's served by the prison or that, that we serve in the prison. Many of them have um, no, they don't have any skills. Their, their skill set is so limited, it's very difficult for them to access information and really giving them the tools or giving them the ways to access um, different resources really, you know, and you can kind of see that now they've got this whole world that opens up to them. That's really what kind of makes me passionate about what I do. And I'll, I'll talk about that more. I've also um, been authorized to provide training on what we're calling as transformative correctional communication. So it's essentially a way to um, encourage, encourage the inmates that we, that we work with to start, getting out of their criminal thinking patterns. Um, so it's a lot of open-ended questions, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of ways to try and draw out, um, draw, out, draw, out, draw out the conversation in a way that's gonna helpfully in, get them to critically think about their perspective and maybe challenge their current, current way of thinking in a way to kind of make them more productive. It's being, um, it's being developed by, um, his name is Scott McClure, and he's worked in corrections for many, many years. And um, it's been an exciting process to be part of that. And within a year, we're gonna be rolling that out um, to every institution. And I'm, I'll be one of the people that's gonna be providing training on that along with several others. And I think it's gonna um, really revolutionize the way that we, um, communicate within corrections. Because um, that's one thing that we want to work work on more because in corrections, you really want to try and get people to do things of their own recognizance because when people kind of get obstinate in corrections, it uh, it results in some kind of bad things that, that can happen. And we all, we, that's one thing that we all want to avoid. So giving a cursory um, overview of, of correctional librarianship and kind of a general sense, this is from some of the literature that I was, I was looking at. Librarianship from the 1800s to really the 1970s was not, was not really um, great. Um, it was, it was more, it, they were lucky if they got anything. It, we were more in that punitive stage. And that's a, that's a really long period of time when you think about it. Um, about the best that they could hope for in a lot of library programs within the prisons was, well, here's some religious materials, you know, essentially read these, you know, take them to heart and you'll be a better person. Um, and that, that happened for many, many years. After that, they might have incorpor they've incorporated maybe some psychologists or, you know, some philosophers and said, well, okay, follow this philosophy or this, this way of thinking and, and you'll be a better person. Um, it was all used essentially to try and change the way the person thought but it was kind of saying like, follow this and, and you're going to do better. It, it really didn't, but that's not really offering, offering a whole lot to the populations that are served in the prison. So for a lot of years, they really didn't have what I would call meaningful library access. Um, in 1915, um, libraries started to focus primarily on the and there was a lot of court cases that kind of dealt with that, providing some legal access to make sure that they had, these guys had access to the court. Um, <clears throat> so and that kind of took over and, and continues to this day and becomes a major component of librarianship, you know, is providing legal access. Um, it wasn't until when, and in 1915, coincidentally, there was a, um, that was the first library guide put out by the American Library Association about, you know, prison libraries. I was looking for, I found a reference to it. I was on a, on a, I was unable to find a copy, unfortunately. I'm still looking. So if anybody finds that, I'd be more than, I'd be really interested to see it. Um, if you want to see any of the information about um, current, uh, basically the current guide to prison libraries, I've got a link right there um, in case anybody's interested to read some literature on that. Um, in the 1970s, you finally started to see more funding uh, for recreational library programs where it was like, where it was, yeah, let's, let's start encouraging these guys to read in other ways except, you know, giving them religious or strictly like self-help uh, materials. Um, and at, since that point, we have seen that our library collections have grown, um, you know, quite a bit. Um, in each of the libraries, any of the, each, each of the prisons, they're all going to have several, either one major library or several small libraries, and all of those libraries are going to have um, 
recreational materials um, for checkout. And it's a big part of what we do along with the legal part of it. Um, and following up with that, prison libraries are the door to the court. Um, we are the primary means that um, inmates receive access to um, access to the court. Um, in the case Bounds versus Smith, um, it requires that librarians run correctional libraries. So you have to have um, you have to have a librarian providing those services, and it also encourages additional rehabilitative programs in that one. Um, Gilmore v. Lynch, another landmark case, establishes minimum standards uh, for library uh, materials. Um, so there's a certain level of um, uh, of materials that we have to keep that we have to maintain in the library, um, no matter what, in order to quantify as like reasonable access to the to the courts. And um, concurrently, a little bit after that. Lewis v. Casey, it's another case that deals with actual injury standards. So, I mean, I don't want people coming into correctional librarianship going, okay, well, if I go in here, I'm going to be getting, you know, all these, case, all these cases, I'm going to have to know all these cases. Um, with Lewis v. Casey, there has to be an actual injury standard for, you know, any, you know, any lawsuits or anything like that related to library access, even though those do happen. So, you know, there's a lot of checks and balances that go with, um, that go with a, uh, access to the library and, and providing uh, legal services to these guys. And really we get to, that just kind of brings us up to today. Cause I think we're all more interested in today than we were about several years ago. I mean, I'm kind of a, kind of a nerd, but I, I only could do so much before I was like, eh, I want to go do something else. Today I think is a very exciting time for correctional librarianship. And that's what I really want to focus on. Um, today we are really motivated to expand access to recreational reading, literacy, programming. That's, that's really what we talk about and what we're all motivated to try and do. We're trying to encourage, encourage additional library programming that's going to, um, that's really going to, to encourage these guys to start challenging their, their criminal thinking you know, behaviors to develop skill sets that are gonna make them more employable when they get out. Um, and the library, in the library, and I'll talk about some of the education programs after this that, that we kind of partner with, um, we have a lot of freedom in what programs we can create um, because we're not, really, we're not really stuck in a curriculum. Uh, we can find, we can identify, we can do in like a needs assessment in our prison and find that, um, yeah, we, people really want to have, like I'm going to say, we, we did kind of a survey and we had some guys that were like, well, we really want to have to do like a trivia program or we want to do like a trivia night or something like that. Um, Cause they thought it'd be kind of fun to like learn some facts and, and, um, and uh, I got my cat hanging on next to me. Um, but like learn some, learn some fat, you know, they want to learn some facts and they want to have some friendly competition. And, and, and so one of my coworkers did a program like that and it was a huge hit. Um, something like that might work in an education and programming, but they aren't given as much latitude. You know, a lot of times they're kind of, kind of focusing on what they need to do. So we do a lot of really cool things and we get a lot of latitude in what we're able to do there. Um, at Salinas Valley, just to kind of share what we're doing, because, you know, when you just kind of see the walls, you just kind of assume you can't really see what's going on there, even though I'm going to put that out there. We're very happy to have people, um, have people come in you know we just have to go through a process and i'll cover that a little bit later and people if you're always free to you know feel free to contact me and we can try and set something up we're um we're um we have at salinas valley we have uh, 12 programs and uh you know 12 academic programs i should have put that there and five career technical training programs on five different yards so we do a tremendous amount of programming on a given day um, and that those programs include adult basic education levels one, two, and three. So we have uh, academic programs for all different um, academic levels that's appropriate to their placement. Uh, we do testing um, for both uh, the GED program and CASAS, which is the Compre Comprehensive Adult Student Assessment System, trying to gauge um, you know, basically what academic services they need. Uh, we provide college programs, um, both through correspondence, through like close coastline. And we also have um, instructors come from Hartnell, uh, which is one of our local community colleges to provide uh, classes as well. Uh, we have programs that focus on um, 
inmates that are part of our enhanced outpatient. So they're in a higher level of mental health care, but we still try and encourage them to get education services while they're also getting treated for their mental health issues. We have um, inmates who are part of our developmental disability program that, um, that um, essentially they have um, a, a mental, um, a mental impairment or disability that, um, you know, we, we are cognizant of, but we make sure that we are able to get them the services that they need to encourage them to further their education. Uh, we have a transitions program, which is set up to um, get uh, to basically develop life skills that guys need, upon, you know, about right before they're about to parole, because many of them don't have those skills, and we want to make sure that they're going to be successful um, in, in making that transition from prison to real life after that. And then we also have several of our career technical education programs. Um, so we've got our HVAC program, heating, air conditioning and cooling, uh, electrical programs, automotive paint, welding, um, office services and related technology, giving these guys the vocational skills they need um, or that are gonna hopefully get them a job once they, um, once they parole and get out, um, making sure, you know, increasing the chance that they're not gonna come back and uh, come back to prison. And through all those academic programs, we really try and support and, and, and partner with them to try and make their programs better. So like, for example, I'm trying to, um, uh, trying to partner with our, our um, welding instructor. Um, so what we're, what we're in the process of doing is purchasing materials to include on the yard where we have, um, where we have our welding program, have materials in the library that are gonna support, um, support the, um, the curriculum that the welding instructor is doing. We're also purchasing uh, with the funding that we have additional sets that we're gonna keep. Um, Cause once these guys go to their welding class, they're behind essentially a wall and they're not able to go until the end of the day. We're creating kind of a satellite library that's gonna be available to those guys with supplemental materials that are both gonna help them, um, not just with welding, but help them with their, um, some of them are also working on trying to get their GED and um, you know trying to get, um, and some of them trying to get like their uh, some testing done for college and that kind of thing. So we're trying to get those materials um, purchased and available to them. So it's really kind of cool when we can work together and try and increase the outcomes and and make the um, you know make the curriculum a little bit easier for these guys to access. You know we don't have to just work in a bubble. We're all kind of partnering to try and make ourselves better. But everything that we do in correctional librarianship is designed to increase public safety. Uh, we want these guys to get the programming they need um, that's going to make them make them successful when they get out. Uh, we don't want to see them come back. I mean, that's when I see guys parole, a lot of times it's like, man, I hope I never see you again. And I think that sometimes that's the best uh, compliment I can give them. So a breakdown of um, how big the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation is. Uh, we have 35 adult institutions, four youth facilities, 44 fire camps, seven community correctional facilities, and two out-of-state transfer facilities. And we are all throughout the state of California. Um, we are a huge entity and we operate in most parts of, of California. Our budget for the 2017-2018 fiscal year was $10.1 billion. So we, um, and we're one of the largest employers in California. Based on what, I, based on records that I could find, kind of breaking down um, those that are listed as full-time, part-time, or intermittent, we employ about 27% of the entire state workforce. Um, at Salinas Valley's, uh, and, and I want to put a caveat on this, um, that doesn't include any contract employees that we have as well. Um, you know that the contract employees that we have are actually not part of this and so we're an even bigger entity than that at salinas valley state prison we employ you know about 1600 people so it takes a lot of people to to run a prison we we require a lot of uh, a lot of people there um if we're looking at just library staff um we have one principal librarian um her name's brandy buenafe and she works at our headquarters she's kind of our the person that oversees the entire library system throughout the state um, we have 35 senior librarians, so each institution, each adult institution is going to have a senior librarian that works there and um, coordinates services for the library program. We have 54 librarians, and um, some, li some facilities will have uh, more than one librarian. It just kind of depends on how many libraries are serviced by that location. 
and then and we also have 83 technical assistants and the same thing that kind of varies depending on the needs of the institution so we have a lot of library staff that we employ through the state and every every facility throughout the state is going to have library staff uh, that work there at present CDCR is responsible for supervising over 183,000 inmates and that was the most current I think that's the most current report that I had access to as of January 10, 2018. So it's a it's a large number of people that are overseen by the like I said, inmates and parolees. I think when I broke it down to the institutions, uh, we have there's about 125,000 people that are currently incarcerated in California. Um, so we have a large population that we need to provide library services to and every one of those individuals has a right to access library services under our policies and procedures. So it's a, it's a big responsibility. The CDCR vision is with our partners we protect the public from crime and victimization. Um, everything that we do is to try and make the public safer. Um, and that works both from the security side, making sure that the guys, you know, that the inmates that we have don't get out. And then it's also working on the rehabilitative side to give these guys the, the tools they need once they get out to, to be successful in society, not reoffend. Um, the mission that we have is to enhance public safety through safety, safe and secure incarceration of offenders, effective parole supervision, and rehabilitative strat strategies to successfully reintegrate offenders into our community. And goes to that we're, we're all about public safety with everything that we do. Now talking about the Office of Correctional Education, um, under the Division of Rehabilitative Programs, which is kind of the major umbrella, but OCE does uh, the bulk of what we do. Um, the other side of that is with the like the substance abuse treatment programs and some of the um, some of the community programs that come in. Um, that's kind of our other partners in this. We provide educational programming, adult basic education, uh, high school equivalency, career technical education, college, recreation, library services, ec educational television programming, and community transition planning. Uh, there's currently a plan. We have a strategic plan in place called the 2020 plan uh, where we're trying to enhance service in these four key areas uh, in environment. So we're trying to create, um, create environments that are going to improve learner outcomes. Um, you know, we're still working on that. Prisons, I'm not going to lie, is a little bit gray sometimes. Uh, we work on trying to make things a little bit, uh, a little bit brighter, but sometimes that's the reality that we have with that we're working with. But we're getting better with that and trying to develop um, to incur increase the technology that we have, um, increase, um, you know, to 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 purchase materials that are going to make coming into the classroom not feel like prison as much, and encourage a um, a kind of a more um, hopefully encourage the students to be more committed to getting improving their education or improving those outcomes. Um, focusing on teaching, creating a culture that embraces continuous improvement, customer focus and student success. Uh, one thing you're going to see is it's it's the focus is now on student success when we're talking about education programming is all trying to make sure that the students are successful and that's what drives the decision making for the um, uh, the Office of Correctional Education now. Um, it's trying to make sure that these guys are successful and they're not going to come back. Um, support, which is a big part of what the the library is part of, that's kind of our thing. Um, utilize resources to enhance student success and, and we're really the key to that, to that number three. Um, we want, the library is trying to be the one that is going to be the kind of the thing that lifts the entire department, you know, uh, the education department up and really makes our programs even more effective and we're really looking for innovative people that are interested in, in, in bringing that forward because, you know, we need those, those fresh ideas coming because I think we, we're the greatest support that we're going to have in, in making these programs successful and access um, right now. And it was kind of funny. We had a, a kind of conversation with, um, uh, I had a conversation not too long ago with uh, Shannon Swain with several others and she's our superintendent. And they were telling us a story about uh, with, within CDCR, they were really excited. It's like, wow, we're reaching half of, you know, half of the uh, inmates that are incarcerated in, in California. And this was a couple years ago. You know, so that's, you know, over 60,000 people. It's like we get services to 60,000 people. Well, the other side of that is like, well, what about the other ones that aren't getting the services that they need? So there's been a huge push to make sure that every, every inmate that's in, in, housed within CDCR has access to some type of rehabilitative programming. And that process is continuing and it keeps getting, it's been getting, my observation is it's been getting better 
you know, year after year after year, we're seeing a lot more programs develop. Uh, so our patrons, we have a lot of different missions. So every institution is going to have a different mission. Some, some are reception centers. So when these guys are finally sentenced by the court, they're sent there, processed, um, and they kind of determine where their placement would be best, at which institution they're going to be best, depending on their, depending on their needs. We have reentry facilities with guys that are going to be that are short to the house that need to, uh, and I should say, you know, short to going home. I'm using my my prison terms without even thinking about it. Um, but they're they're going to be paroling soon, so they need those reentry services to you know, right now to make sure that they're going to, or to encourage them to be successful about when, when they get out. We have high security institutions working in prison. Some guys aren't super nice. So, you know, they need a higher level of security. I happen to work at one of those institutions. So we have additional precautions that are in place with those. We have uh, female institutions that only house uh, female offenders and they have specialized programming because of that. Um, but when you're working within CDCR, you're generally working with, um, inmates that are there because of a felony conviction and and just so we're not sugarcoating that with anybody um a felony conviction is a serious crime punishable by imprisonment for more than one year or by death examples include burglary arson rape and murder so when you work with cdcr these are the guys that you're going to be working with um you know they they weren't there for for stealing from the collection plate they they were there for doing some bad stuff so and that's one thing that's that's not for everybody and but it's you know, once you kind of recognize that um, and you can see that we work in a very safe environment because of the support that we have from several different staff, it's definitely manageable. And we also do have some uh, mental health placement. I work with some that are they basically they have safety concerns with working, being in the state hospitals while they're trying to get better to go to trial. And sometimes those are part of our population as well. Um, the patients we have largely people of color. Um, most are from lower economic, so you know they have a lower economic status. Um, there's a lot of substance abuse issues. Uh, we deal with a lot of mental health concerns, uh, which many are not identified until they get to get to prison and they finally get treatment. Um, many of them have limited education, and many have a limited employment history. So we're, you know, we're working sometimes with with uh, people who haven't had a whole lot of opportunities to this point. We're we're trying to do a lot of catch up. So that's one of the challenges and one of the things that kind of motivates us to try and get them those skills and, and make up for lost time. So day in the life. Um, prison life is regimented. Uh, we have times for everything. We have a schedule that pretty much doesn't change day to day to day. We have a time for breakfast. There's a time to go to come to the library, time to go to education. They have appointments to go to medical. They have a certain, amount, a certain time to go to yard. Everything is very, very regimented, very structured. But conversely, it's always subject to change. Um, if there's an incident that happens on the yard, or, or you know, um, there could be a natural disaster that happens, a pipe could break, um, something, some, some major event can happen, and then our program gets suspended. So it's, it's, it's interesting. On one hand, we're very regimented, and on the other, you have to be quick to adapt to change at any time because you never know when it's going to happen. So like going through my day, um, my work day starts at 7.30 in the morning and I'm gonna use military time because that's what we do in corrections. So I'm started at 07.30 hours. I check in, I do my security checks. One thing you do in, in, in a prison, no matter who you are, is check your area to make sure that there's no safety issues um, that can occur later and that you've got your inventory. Um, everything can be accounted for because it's amazing what you can make a weapon out of. Um, I confer with my coworkers because we work. Um, I work along with education staff in the same area, so I coordinate with them. I coordinate with our local officer to find out if there's anything, any changes to programming that day. If I need to modify what I'm going to do based on um, our current program, um, just so I can I can generate the appropriate list. So. Um, the housing units can be notified who I want to come to library today. Unlike out there in the public, we kind of do everything by, um, we schedule everybody. So they have to, um, we have to schedule them to, to show up and they're not just able to walk out of their cell and, and come to the library. We have to actually say, okay, I want this individual and this individual and this individual. And we have systems in place to make sure that that's done fairly and, uh, and concurrent with the policy that we have. Um, usually our library program begins by about 0830 oh, hours, so 830 in the morning. Um, when inmates get there, we have to have them sign in. Um, 
we have to identify who our inmates are because um, we have to, we have to know if they've had access in the event of like litigation. You know, one thing that happens is if these guys claim they don't have access to the library, sometimes they will they will tell us uh, they'll initiate a lawsuit trying to say that they didn't receive access to the court. We have to demonstrate that they did have access to the court through their access history, um, and we're also aware of knowing who's there. You know, we have to know who is in our library at at any particular time. In the event there is some event that some some event happens that we have to be we have to be accountable and we have to be able to account for all the inmates that are there to make sure everybody's safe and uh, you know and make sure that we can kind of we can kind of manage the event the best we can. Um, during a session, um, I basically, I'll work with my library clerks and I've paid uh, inmate library clerks that assist me for the most part. Um, so we do a lot of reference requests, most primarily legal, but we'll get other reference requests. We do photocopies, we provide forms to the court, and we do a lot of, um, uh, and we provide access or assistance in utilizing our um, leads or library electronic delivery system computers to access legal, legal information on the computer. That's one thing I kind of enjoy doing because I, I enjoy doing search strategies. So it's kind, of, it's kind of fun to work with these guys, especially many of them who have kind of those limited technology, you know, limited technology experience and kind of give them tools and kind of open up those resources to them. Um, we provide access to the court in accordance with the California Code of Regulations, Title 15, Division 2. Um, so if anybody really wants to know how CDCR runs or what our policies are, that's where you would look. Uh, the specific version for this for access to the court is 3160. Uh, we provide re reference services. So um, since we're, they don't have internet in most cases or not supposed to, uh, you know, we're kind of their point of contact if they need anything for their class, if they need anything for their um, for their legal cases. Um, a lot of times we're going to be the primary reference or primary reference service that they're going to use within the prison. Uh, we provide um, access to whatever recreational reading that we have. Um, that's a, that's part of what we do. Um, provide copies of court and administrative forms um, and provide photocopy services to the courts. And some institutions are doing e-filing. The institution I'm at, we haven't started that yet. We run until about 11, 15 hours, do another inventory and security check, which is a big part of what we do, take a 30 minute lunch, 12.30, we kind of rinse and repeat, do the same thing, do another inventory check and we're done by 1600 hours. Now during that day, we might have special projects that we're gonna do, we're given a lot of latitude with what we, what we need to do. Um, skills to develop as a correctional librarian, you develop communication, um, you develop uh, policy develop. You, know, you learn how well. You learn how to communicate because sometimes we deal with some very uh, challenging individuals. Uh, you learn how to develop policies and how to implement them because we work in a very policy driven and kind of a rule driven. Um, as I was saying, like the Title Fifteen, uh, Division Two, which kind of coordinates our policies. You have to work within that policy. So when we develop policies, we have to make sure it jives with that. So you kind of learn how to how to manage those different policies and kind of create it to hopefully uh, encourage whatever whatever policy you're doing for your library program to be successful. Uh, you learn to be situationally aware. Um, since we're safety conscious, you learn how to notice when things don't feel right or when there's something that's just kind of a little off. It's kind of something that you develop over years working, working in corrections. Um, you learn how to develop programming. Um, I, I, you know, you can develop some really fun programming while you're while you're working for CDCR. And you learn how to work with other departments, other staff. We coordinate with um, medical, we coordinate with um, teachers, we coordinate with custody. So you find out to talk to different people, a lot of different people with different missions. Um, as, a lecture, as a correctional librarian, you're given a lot of latitude in how to run your program within policy. And, and I'll put that out there. When, you, when you're a librarian or you're a senior librarian, it's, it's really your program in a lot of ways. And you're given kind of, I don't want to say free reign, but you're given a lot of latitude in how you want to run, run your program and what's going to be interesting, what's going to be of interest to you and what's going to benefit your patrons the most. So now I can finally get to talk about the actual position. So thank you for bearing with me, everybody. Um, correctional librarian positions. So the first thing that we have is a library technical assistant. Um, there's the pay range right there. Usually it requires uh, two years of increasingly responsible um, two years of library experience, or you have to have an AA in, in, or equivalent in library science. Um, 
since I'm talking to people here at San Jose State, I think this is a great option if you're trying to get into state service because it can help you build your retirement, um, let you learn what it likes to what it's like to work in a correctional library, and um, basically get the you know, benefits of working as an employee while you complete your degree. And then once you've completed that degree, then I would definitely encourage you to go for the um, uh, you know, go for a librarian, a librarian position or senior librarian position, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, I want to put this out there. There, during our last contract negotiations with um, SEA 1000, there are some tuition reimbursement programs that may exist for LTA positions, and there might be some alternate schedules. But what I would say is, um, when you're interviewing, to make sure to, you know, get that worked out. You know, work with the supervisor and see what's available there, because um, it's it's. The programs exist, but you just want to make sure that there's funding and a few other things that, that are there. Um, but I want to put those out there so you know about them. And if anybody has any questions after this, I'm more than happy to, to point you in the right direction that will tell you about those resources. Um, the librarian position, um, there's the pay range right here. The, the greatest thing about this, it's entry level, but there's no experience needed. Um, we are happy to train you if you take on a job working as a um, CDCR librarian. Um, we want to give you the, um, we want you to be successful, and there's many of us that will mentor you, um, will give you resource, you know, give you the resources you need to be successful. Um, and also, please note, you can apply while attending school, but must have completed one year towards an MLIS to be offered employment. So you don't even have to complete your degree at present. You can come work for corrections after a year and, want, and just continue working on your degree, and, and you can still be, and you can be working in a librarian position. And the senior librarian position, um, usually, you know, you're going to be in charge of a, of a library program at an institution. Um, it takes two years of experience working as a correctional librarian, um, a correctional librarian or a librarian, or three years of increasingly responsible and very professional library experience. So you can come from the outside if you've got that experience, and you can come in as a senior librarian too. And um, it's kind of the same rules. You have to have completed at least one year towards your MLS to be offered employment as a senior librarian as well. So there's a lot of opportunities and we're not asking you to, you know, know everything when you come in. We just, you know, we want somebody to come in and we can, we can help you be successful. We've got a lot of support systems built up that way. So the way that you would apply is go to um, cdcr.ca.gov, career opportunities, got a link there. Um, and click on library services and it'll give you all the information you would need. You would need to fill out a, um, you'd need to mail a state application, which is an STD 678, fill that out, and also submit the supplemental questionnaire. Once you're on the, once you're on a list, after submitting the supplemental questionnaire, that placement is good for 12 months. Uh, one thing I will caution you with is make sure you meet those minimum qualifications before applying, or you could be you could be barred for applying in a 12 month period. There is a possibility. It doesn't happen that often, but I want to put that out there. And also be patient; it may take some time. Um, I would encourage some people who are maybe just starting their um, starting their education at San Jose um, to go ahead and apply as soon as you can, because sometimes it can take a while to get on the list. You know, sometimes it can take a month or two, um, but as you move forward, it's gonna, you're gonna get through the process and then you'll be in a position where you could be offered employment right away and kind of start that career while you finish up your education and have a good career to, to show for it. Um, my, our principal librarian um, went ahead and put this offer out there. If anybody has any questions about the hiring process or needs any assistance, feel, pre, feel free to contact her. Um, I would say email is the best way. Um, email her and she will, um, she will get you put in touch with the right the right resources you need to get to navigate the application process. And you can contact me as well. I will make sure to refer your information to her as well. Um, some of the challenges when working with this population, it's primarily direct service. It's not like lockup where you're gonna have um, glass in between you. You work directly with the inmates. You're in the same room as them for the most part. Um, that's that's something that we kind of that you kind of have to navigate and so it makes you very situationally aware because you are you know dealing with convicted felons you have to develop a security mindset while you're there um, <clears throat> everything we do is uh, has security in mind um, we're about public safety so that's a mindset that we have to get into when we get into the prison and and as soon as we get in the gate until we leave we have to make sure that we have that's basically that security uh security 
security hat on, making sure that we're doing things safely. We work within a paramilitary structure within the prison. Um, so there's going to be a lot of, uh, if for people who are in the military, would probably be comfortable with this. Some people aren't comfortable with it. Um, so some of our decision making is done kind of in that, that type of structure. Um, we deal with resource issues sometimes um, with the state, like anything else, it kind of ebbs and flows. Sometimes we're, we're doing great and we have plenty of money to meet all of our needs. Other times the state budget kind of goes on the wayside and, and sometimes we're, doing, we're trying to do what we were doing with less. Uh, we deal with litigation uh, from inmates and that sometimes that can be time intensive and um, takes a lot of time. The only thing I will put is the Attorney General's office does support, you know, does um, represent us in those issues, you know, those cases. So most of the time you're not going to have to see anything if, if you ever become uh, named in an action. And then separating work from personal life can be challenging for some because you kind of get stuck in that security mindset and some people aren't able to leave it, leave it, leave it at work. Um, we do have uh, the employee assistance program and the peer, and peer support personnel to help through those challenges. However, the advantages, like I said, there's no experience necessary. Um, we have a great library support network. Um, we have the Institutional Library Advisory Committee that I'm on. Uh, we have people that can mentor. We have email groups that we had work continually. We have an instant messaging program. Uh, we have statewide trainings that we do. We also go to conferences um, regularly as long as they're in California. So like the California Library Association Conference, um, most of us are invited to attend that every year at, at, at um, by the state and they provide our, our hotels and conference fees and everything else, at least right now. And it's, it's great that we're able to do that kind of uh, professional training. Um, within our institutions, we do, regular staff, we do regular staff trainings. We also are working with professional learning community, community um, I should have put communities instead of committees, um, where we're trying to build more cohesiveness within our departments. And then what I'm on the transformative correctional communication, developing new ways to, to, to you know, to communicate with each other. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility in the job. Um, you can, essentially, you can make the job what you want. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of latitude to to develop the type of librarianship that you're interested in, and um, build the type of program that you want as long as it kind of falls within that policy. And final thoughts. I think it's a great career. I've been doing it for a lot of times. So it or I've been doing it for ten years now. And um, it can be either a lifelong career um, or it can be something that's going to help you get to the next part of your career. Um, like I said, when you come in, we're going to, uh, there's many of us that are committed to making you, making sure that you're successful and giving, given kind of what you need to, to, to grow yourself professionally. And there's many of us that are very encouraged to, to do that. And we're, I'm, this is kind of me, but I'm going to put it out there. We're looking for people who are passionate about programming and looking to improve the culture of correctional librarianship. Um, so if you're if you kind of want to make a difference, even if it's making a difference one person at a time, I know we said one book at a time at the beginning. Um, you can you can do that in corrections. You can be very proud of what you do at the end of the day. So this is me. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions after this. Um, I'm I'm more than happy to field what questions I can. I can't field questions if you want to find out how like inmate Smith is doing. Is he eating enough? I can't do those kind of questions, but I can do um, you know I can definitely put you put you in contact with the right person if it's a question outside of my expertise, or I can put you in, in touch with the. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just there to try and answer whatever questions I have. Um, what I would encourage anybody to do who's interested in working in a prison, contact, um, contact me or contact um, Brandy Buenafe, our principal librarian, to set up a tour. Um, if you're interested in seeing what's going on, we're, we're a public entity and we have a responsibility to, to be transparent with what we do. And we're very happy to show off what we, what we do and um, you know, make sure that you're comfortable if you're ever considering a career, knowing what you're walking into. These are some of my sources if anybody's interested in, in looking at those. And it's finally time for questions and I talked for way too long. This is Kim and I'm going to encourage everybody um, to go ahead and unmute themselves and ask questions if, they, if you have them um, because I think that we've got a small group and that might be easier. But I'm reading Kelsey's question. Can you put up Brandy's information one more time? So if we could put up Brandy's slide. Oh, absolutely. And, and when Matthew and I were talking about this before, he was saying that Brandy is actually very, very excited to work with any of the San Jose students 
And so I would encourage you to feel very comfortable reaching out to her. And then we have a question there, um, Matthew from Dennis. Okay, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Here we go. So is it okay if I read the question? Just read the yep. whole thing? Yep. Okay, I'm curious what kind of digital resources inmates in California have access to. I work for the New York um, State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision at Downstate uh, uh, Correctional Facility in Fish Fishkill, New York, which is a maximum security reception facility at, at the moment, computer access. They are only able to access two legal databases in the department directives that, okay. So typewriters are used for word processing. Well, so you're talking about like the type of uh, electronic resources that we have. Right now, the primary um, electronic resource that we have is our, um, what we call our leads computer. So it's access to our legal information. Um, that's that's kind of the, the primary resource that we give to these guys. Um, anything outside of that right now, um, we are, um, Currently, library staff are kind of having to facilitate for them because they're not able to directly access the internet. Um, so we kind of have to be that go-between. So, but in the future, um, I'm not sure how far away this is. We are working to try and create essentially whitelisted sites um, for um, our inmates to access. Uh, you know, to do like research projects or, or um, especially for the college program. That's kind of how we're using it to get there. But. So they'll have access to certain sites that have been opened up on essentially a Wi-Fi network. Um, that's currently being rolled out. I don't know when the completion date is because I don't have that information in front of me. Um, but I would, I probably want to say probably within like, uh, I want to say five years, we'll probably have something like that rolled out. And, and Matt, a question from Isaiah. Yep. Are there any in, in, intern oppor op, internship opportunities within the CDCR library system? You know, that was actually brought up, um, I think, uh, what was it, Kim and I were talking about that, you know, about some internship opportunities. And I'm going to follow up with that. I haven't had an opportunity, but we're going to, we're going to try and, um, we're going to try and figure, you know, figure out what might be available. Um, there's been a kind of a hurdle with some of the internship opportunities because of some of the liability issues. Cause when you're working around inmates, um, you know, because we're all working there, you know, we have certain protections, but if you're an, in, if you're an intern that may or may not exist. So that's kind of been the challenge there, but I'm going to follow up and, and see if something like that could, could occur. It's just going to be above my level, unfortunately. Isaiah, um, once we do find out, we'll make that information available to the students. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a, a question, um, Matthew, as I was listening to you describe your day and what you do, have you ever felt threatened in your job? The only, me personally, no. I've never felt threatened. Um, I'm not gonna say, and maybe that's just my communication style. I, I tend to be, um, I, I tend to try and deescalate things verbally. That's one thing I, I, I feel like I've been very successful doing. There have been some library staff that have been threatened. One thing that I will put is when we come into our, um, our work area, uh, we have what, what's called a personal alarm device or a pad. It looks like a, it looks like a little, um, it looks like a little like garage door opener, but if I were to, if I've needed to hit, you know, if I have to hit that, and I've had to hit it once in my career, it wasn't anything for me. It was something that I observed a fight. When I hit that, within about ten seconds, you've got a a cavalry of people that are coming, a cavalry of officers to come address that situation. So, in some ways, working working in the prison is 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 safer than working in like a public school. Right. Interesting. Do we have any other questions? Okay, I work in an adult uh, work in adult ed in a county jail. Is being in prison similar? Um, I've talked to some. I've had some colleagues that have worked in um, mostly in juvenile halls, but they've worked in some other places, um, in other correctional facilities. There's a, there's a lot of similarities. In some ways, I think the, the major the major difference that I've noticed is that in some of the county jails, they didn't have as many resources as some of the state prisons do. Um, we actually have um, we actually have a lot more programs than than they were used to to working with, probably just because of funding sources. Um, 
so in some in some ways they they got a lot more resources working for the working for a state prison than they did working for the county that was just my experience okay well thank you so much matthew for sharing this information with us i it's fascinating to me and as something that I had never considered before, but what a great way to get your career started if you're having a tough time um, finding a way into sort of launching your LIS career. And then like happens so often in your career, you never know when you might fall in love with it and realize this is exactly what you're interested in. So thank you to Matthew. This session has been recorded and we will let you know when it's available for viewing. Thank you all for attending and I hope you have a great rest of the evening.